Um, good evening, everyone. I am Mari Carmen Cifuentes from the Addison Public Library. I am with Adult Services, and I'm very happy to welcome you tonight to a special program, um, this evening's author event with Subankam Ramabonsa, the author of How to Pronounce Knife and one of our summer reading books. Um, before we start, I want to just share and say a, a few words about um, our uh, upcoming programs that we think that you will also enjoy. Um, one moment, please, let me see. We will also have another author event on Monday, this coming Monday, July 26 at 7 p.m. with Robert Crace, the author of um, Suspect, also one of our summer reading books. In addition, we will have some book discussions with our books for our retreat with, um, by Emily Henry on Tuesday, August 10th, and The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett on August 16th, Monday, August 16th. So we hope that you are able to join us. And so I am very um, excited to introduce Suvankam Damalonsa. Um, she was born in a Leo refugee camp in Nankai, Thailand, and was raised and educated in Toronto. She is the award-winning author of four books of poetry, and her fiction has also appeared in Harper's, Granta, The Paris Review, uh, Plowshares, Best American Non-Required Reading 2018, and the Old Henry Prize Stories um, 2019. And her uh, most recent uh, publication, the collection of short stories, How to Pronounce Knife, uh, was the winner of the 2020 Scotia um, Giller Prize. Um, so, you know, and, and I have to say, we are so pleased that um, this book was part of our summer reading program this year, and that many of you are, are reading this book um, during the summer. So welcome, uh, Savanka, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, How to Pronounce Knife was one of our selections for summer reading. So many of our community members in Addison um, are reading this title at this time. And, um, you know, books come up a lot in your in your stories, you know, in books, the act of storytelling, you know, reading, writing, um, you know, we see books, they're a source of knowledge and information. They're also, you know, a source of comfort and, and bonding. So, could, you know, to start off with, could you tell us a little bit about the role that books played in your life from growing up and also about your journey towards becoming an author? I grew up in a home without books. My parents um, didn't have any books in the home for us. Anytime I saw a bookshelf, it was usually at a friend's house. Um, and I always begged my parents to take a photograph of me in front of those bookshelves because like the way that we would um, when we go on vacation and we think that the things we see on vacation are things that we might not ever see again. So um, I actually have lots of photographs of myself in front of bookshelves. Um, but um, libraries were the place where I could take a book on that bookshelf and take it home. Um, and when I was very young, they had these cassettes that came with books in a plastic bag. I guess this was before audio books. And that was where I learned how to read. My parents um, didn't read very well, or if they did, or when they did learn, um, they didn't pronounce the words properly, but from the library and in that, um, plastic bag was a cassette with a voice that taught me um, how to read the words properly. That's lovely, and lovely you know, that you mentioned um, libraries. <laughs> I think on one of our social media posts um, to promote your, your book, we were asking our patrons if anyone wanted to share photos of themselves, you know, with their, of their bookshelves or of their, their, their bookshelves. Um, it, it, you know, and I understand that you have some photos. I do. 
um, that that inspired the uh, story collection, and um, that I think readers who are joining us tonight will uh, really love to see. Um, this is a photograph of me on picture day. It's just like the book where the little girl, Joy, is wearing a green jogging suit. My parents didn't know that picture day is about dressing up. But, um, so I just wore the outfit that I had on that day, which was a green jogging suit. Um, this is the country that my parents are from. I've actually never been in that country because they were refugees and they left that country um, and lived in a refugee camp in Thailand where I was born. I found this map. Um, it belonged to my father, as you can see. Um, I was taken aback by it because usually in school, North America is on the left. But here, where my parents are from, it's at the center of the world. Um, I never saw myself as a writer from the margins. Um, I saw myself always at the center of the story, basically at the center of the world, because that was my parents' worldview. This is what the language, the Lao language looks like. Um, I don't know how to read or write it. I don't think of myself as a Lao writer. I think someone who lives in Laos is a Lao writer. And, you know, if I said I was one, someone living and writing there might take offense to such a title. This is me in the middle there, a child in the Lao refugee camp. Um, in Thailand, my father is the man on the left. He was a fan of the Beatles. And as you can see, he still cared about style. He should have buttoned his collared shirt to the very top, but he thinks it's quite cool like the Beatles to um, unbutton a few. The things behind him, are the things that he made in the refugee camp, waiting to hear responses from around the world to see who would take us in. As you can, um, as you can see, you, maybe you'll notice in this photograph next to everybody's face is a number, one, two, and three. This is the photograph that got us sponsored to Canada. We wanted to come to America, but what my father did was not a job that America understood. It wasn't an accountant, a teacher, um, a professor. He didn't have a PhD. Um, he carved those things behind him. He was an artist, which, you know, could also be mistaken for, because it's such a vague term for being a communist. So my family was not sponsored but we were sponsored to Canada. This is our first day in Canada. As you can see, that's snow. <laughs> um, the closest thing that my parents had ever gotten too cold was ice cubes. They didn't have a word for snow, so they called that stuff on the ground ice cubes. That's me in the little blue um, snowsuit. I'd never seen snow before. This is a photograph of me as a kid. Um, it describes and set, is actually the tone of many of the stories in How to Pronounce Knife. You'll always see a child taking care of things themselves. Here I am, very loved by that woman who is holding me there. But if you look closer, I'm holding on to the branch. If for, by some accident she were to, drop, were to drop me, I can hang there and save myself. This is my dad and my brother there. My parents named me Suvankam, but it's, it's difficult for people to pronounce. So they weren't going to make the same choice for my brother, my little brother. He would be named John. <laughs> um, 
that that is his first day um, joining us at home. And as you can see, the expression on my face there is the moment I realize I am not the only one. This is my favorite outfit, or so my parents told me. I believe it may be my only outfit. When I was a kid, I didn't know we were poor. Um, anytime I needed something or wanted something, uh, my parents would um, take what I wanted or asked for and tell me I couldn't have it. Like for example, if I had a hole in my shoe and I needed a new pair of shoes, they would not admit that we were poor and that we, they couldn't buy me a new pair of shoes. So they would say, wait till summer comes, your shoe will be the rage because it's naturally air conditioned. This is me at the library. Um, I still, I still remember it as such a lovely place to be. Um, I didn't know, you know, that 40 years later, um, I would write one of those books behind me, or at least a book that would be in the library there. Um, again, my green jogging suit, it's all I ever wore in all these photographs. Then one day this happened. It was given to my brother. To be honest, I think I look cuter in it. Uh, this, my dad taught me how to ride my bike. I always thought my brother was the favorite, but if you look behind the garbage can there on the left, the lower left is my little brother. Um, he's looking on. When he learns how to ride a bike, there will be no one there to take a picture. This is me grow, uh, on a Sunday afternoon in Canada. This is what we do there, we skate. I used to skate for eight hours. Um, I had no idea eight hours passed. It was just incredibly fun um, to, you know, glide on these two very sharp blades. This is the high school I went to. In our yearbook, the last name Wen spanned for 19, 20 pages. Um, I, I didn't feel like I was an outcast or anything like that. Everyone looked like me or most people looked like me. Um, everyone around me was an immigrant or a refugee. I didn't stand out in any way. These two are my best friends, Gayatri and Zebart. I never thought my name was strange or anything like that because my friends also had these quote, strange names. Uh, this is the book that I'll be reading from tonight. I wrote it simply because I want to. I know that doesn't sound very radical or profound or special, but if we ever think about anything that we've ever wanted in our life um, and the things that we do to achieve that want, um, we'll actually see that actually it is profound and meaningful and radical. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's, um, and it really gives us, you know, to see some of the parallels from the images and your sharing um, and with, with your stories. Uh, the, you mentioned the, the one photo when you were on the branch and about children taking care of themselves, which it really strikes me in regards to thinking about your stories. Um, we have a reading circle class here for um, English language learners. And over the past couple of months, we read two of your stories um, together. We take turns reading them aloud and then talking about them. So the first one, how to pronounce knife and um, chicka chi. And kind of as a part of the uh, conversations around the stories, you know, one thing that we've observed in how to pronounce knife is a child who um, wants to take care of her parents. She wants to kind of 
protect them from possible embarrassment. You know, and then in other stories, you know, we meet a child who um, writes to Randy Travis on behalf of his mother, though he, uh, the child doesn't necessarily write <laughs> what the mother wants. You know. There's um, the child in Edge of the World who will read books and make up stories for, for the mother. Um, and then there are several other instances. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about the role and, and the voice and this power of um, children and the immigrant and refugee families that you portray? Here, uh, we know and hear a lot about racism and how and we often um, encounter these experiences outside of the home and from strangers. And, and structurally and institutionally. But um, I wanted to take a look at how racism can affect our lives intimately, where a parent, because of the way um, that they're treated with their knowledge or lack of knowledge with the language, that they lose their power and authority um, and, and their greatness within the structure of the family. They become a very childlike. And then the child is forced to become a grown up um, and to make decisions that, you know, a child their age should be blowing bubbles um, and swimming in the swimming pool. Um, there's a distinction that I make within my stories. Um, and that is um, the distinction between, it's a very fine distinction between um, point of view and perspective. Um, the point of view is an adult's point of view, but the perspective is a child's. Um, all these stories are actually adult stories, but we don't know that until we get to the very end and we discover that it's actually an adult talking about what it was like when they were growing up um, or, or recounting a moment um, um, that, that affected them um, when they were a child. Um, I thought maybe um, my, now we might... Um, hear what those stories sound like um, in, in my own voice. Uh, one thing I wanted to make sure of when I wrote this collection is that um, whenever we encounter immigrants and refugees, they are always incredibly sad. Um, and, um, or, or, or feeling humiliated and embarrassed or want to fit in. And the thing about my stories is that um, they don't do that. Um, there are sad moments, but that is not all there is for the main character in the story. Um, in How to Pronounce Knife, the little girl not once is it ever mentioned that she's embarrassed or humiliated. Um, or ashamed that she doesn't know the English language. What she is, is that she's alone with the language. Um, so I'm going to read a little from how to pronounce, the opening story, how to pronounce knife. Later that night, the child looks over at her father during dinner, how he picks up each grain of rice with his chopsticks, not dropping a single one. How he eats, clearing away everything in his bowl, how small and shrunken he seems. The child does not tell him the K in knife is silent. She doesn't tell him about being in the principal's office, about being told of rules and how things are the way that they are. It was just a letter, she was told, but that single letter out there alone and in the front was why she was in the office in the first place. She doesn't tell how she had missed, how she had insisted the letter K was not silent. It couldn't be. And she had argued and argued 
It's in the front, the first one. It should have a sound. And then she screamed as if they had taken some important thing away. She never gave up on what her father said on that first sound there. And none of them, with all their lifetimes of reading and good education, could explain it. As she watches her father eat his dinner, she thinks of what else he doesn't know, what else she would have to find out for herself. She wants to tell her father that some letters, even though they are there, we do not say them, but she decides now is not the time to say such a thing. Instead, she tells her father only that she has won something. At the end of the school day, Miss Choi was waiting for her by the door. She asked the child to follow her to the front desk where she unlocked the top drawer and pulled out a red velvet sack. Pick one, she said, and the child reached inside and grabbed at the first thing her fingers touched. It was a puzzle with an airplane in the sky. When she shows her father the prize, he is delighted because in some way he has won it too. They take the prize, all the little pieces of it, and start forming the edge the blue sky, the other pieces, the middle, the whole picture, they fill those in later. I thought I might read uh, the, the Randy Travis one after, after this. W would that be all right? Yeah, I mean, do you want to read okay. it right now or? Uh, yeah, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> Randy Travis. Um, for those who do not know, I am actually a Randy Travis fan. <laughs> um, Randy Travis. The only thing my mother liked about the new country we were living in was its music. She especially loved American country music because it reminded her of the way the women in her family talked among themselves. It felt familiar, the pleas, the gossip, the dreams of the big city, what it was like to come from a place no one had ever heard of. The songs my mother loved most were by a man named Randy Travis. My father was nothing like Randy Travis. No one noticed who he was or what he did for his living. My father thought it was ridiculous to be moaning about love so much. What kind of man was Randy Travis with his health, his looks, his money, his fame, that he should ever have anything to cry about? One morning, my mother gave me some money to buy one of those teen bop magazines so we could find a mailing address for Randy Travis at the back of it. She couldn't read or write English. She told me to write a note to him for her. I did not know what to write. I must have been about seven. What could I know then about the language of adult love? I didn't like how my mother was acting, and I was afraid of what would happen to my father if Randy Travis ever wrote back. So I wrote, I do not like you. My mother would never know what I had written. I told her I'd written, I love you forever and ever, just like his song. She smiled and then signed her name underneath. We sent these cards to Randy Travis again and again, and though no one ever wrote back, my mother insisted we keep on sending them. 
I tried to think of what to write and thought of the things people wrote in the bathroom at school or spray painted on the brick outside our building. You're ugly, go back home. Loser. We must have sent out hundreds of these cards, spending money on stamps and envelopes. My mother always hoping to get something back. It wasn't any different than what she had done to come to this country, she said. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. Um, seeing here, so I um, you know, love how you talk about and, and before how you mentioned, but also you know, there's the power, there's also the joy in, in the voices and actions of all that your characters do. You know, um, throughout the stories, you see that you feel a tension. You know, there's a tension between like the um, known, the unknown, the immediacy and in, in distance, the um, voiced and the silent, you know, that insistence on the silent K at the beginning, but you know, that really should be heard, that should be, you know, present because it's, it's there, right? It's there at the, at, the, at the start. And we see it, for example, in this Randy Travis story um, as well. Can you speak or uh, you know, expand a bit more about like these tensions um, that you know speak to this breath and power of your your characters? You know, as they're trying to figure out between like the being told this is how things is and fitting in and creating their own their own voice and, and presence. Um, I. I, I'm in these stories, I'm drawing attention to the power of the English language, the knowledge that we have when we have the English language, when we know it. But I'm also making fun of the English language um, in the English language. Um, I, I mean, um, you know, I... In, I'm, I'm writing in English, but I'm also making fun of the language, but also drawing attention to its wonder and, and, and the curiosity that I have for the English language. Sometimes this isn't so clear, um, but I've seen um, this book translated into other languages. Um, like for example, I read the French of how to pronounce knife and I hadn't realized that yeah, in other languages that the, how I'm playing with the English language and what I'm saying about the English language, it's a lot more clear in, um, it's a lot more clear in another language. Um, but in the English language, um, it, 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 it requires you, um, to push a little bit on pretending not to know the English language, even as you're reading the English language right in front of you. Sorry, I don't know why uh, there's um, construction going on so close. I hope you don't hear that. Oh no, very little. And actually there's a, a concert in the village going on. <laughs> We're just, you know, less than, you know, in the past the building next door, so I don't, hopefully that's not being heard. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I love how, and you, and you can feel that, you know, in, in your writing, I mean, it's um, in terms of, you know, language, it's very, you know, it's direct and concise. At the same time, it's so poignant and, you know, incisive. And it's also, I feel like, you know, textured is layered. And I love the, um, well, I love hearing you read in your voice and, you know, with your pace and, and cadence. Um, but there... I, I was at an event um, and the host there had described um, my voice or the voice of the stories as dripping with acid. And I kind of like that description because um, 
some of these stories are sometimes read or thought of as being sad. Um, but if you heard me read from um, the opening story, How to Pronounce Knife, it's, it's not sad at all. And in fact, when the little girl is describing uh, the father um, um, having his meal, he picks up every single grain of rice. And if you've ever had a bowl of rice and you had to pick it up with chopsticks, each grain, to be able to do that to each grain is actually very difficult. Although it's not overtly said, in that moment, she's looking at the skill that her father has and that nobody at school has. And it's that, that knowledge that maybe won't necessarily be found in books, right? But in that, you know, lived experience and that deep respect for, and I think in how to- right. oh, I mean, we often value knowledge so much, um, but sometimes not knowing, um, is valuable too. Or um, like, for example, not knowing that your parents don't know how to read or write English um, is something you want to hold on to as, as a kid. Um, you don't want to know that um, there's something that they're incapable of doing. I think you also feel a deep love throughout the stories. Um, for example, in, in, in How to Pronounce Knife, my impression is from the beginning when she's describing the room, you know, they, they had started, the father had started to paint. Um, and I know that you know, painting kind of comes in, in in some other stories or at the end, they're working together on the puzzle, right? And it's kind of like this fitting together and it's still need to, to finish filling it out, right? The puzzle that, that is life, but there is that hope in terms of it's the sky, there's you know, the airplane, there's the, the, the dreams, right? It's, it's life in the making. That these are bits and pieces. We don't, in a life, we don't have the whole story yet. We just have bits and pieces. And, and those bits and pieces, even though that they're, they're not whole, um, they're meaningful. Yes. Um, thinking about a bit then the bits and pieces and the puzzle and, and even the images that you showed us showed us the, the, the world map and you know um, Laos being at, at the center of the map your parents had. Um, would you like to read from Edge of the World at the time? Of course. It's one of my favorite stories. It was published in the Atlantic and I got so many comments about um, readers hoping that I find my mother. And the funny thing was I didn't, you know, I didn't want to tell them that it's not a true story because it was such a compliment that they just couldn't believe that I made up a story. It just felt so real and they wanted to see it as a real story. Edge of the World. My mother peered at the puzzle of the world and pointed at a green spot and said that was where she is from, a tiny country on the lower far right. Then she pointed to where we were at this moment, a large pink area at the top far left. She pointed to the puzzle's edge and then to the floor where there was nothing. It's dangerous there. She said, you fall off. No, you don't, I said. The world is round. It's like a ball. But my mother insisted, that's not right. Still, I continued. When you get to the edge, you just come right back around the other side. How do you know, she said. I didn't know exactly. It's flat, my mother said touching the map like this. Then she swept the puzzle to the floor with her palm. All the connected pieces broke off from each other. The hours lost in a single gesture. Just because I never went to school doesn't mean I don't know things. 
I thought of what my mother knew then. She knew about war, what it felt like to be shot at in the dark, what death looked like up close, what a bomb could destroy. Those were things I didn't know about, and it was all right not to know them. Living where we did now, in a country where nothing like that happened. There was a lot I did not know. We were different people, and we understood that then. It's snowing, my mother said. She said it once like that, in a small, clear voice, it's snowing. But the way she said it made it seem like it was not about snow at all, something that I can't ever know about her. Soon after, some time in the night, when I was asleep, she walked out the door with a suitcase. My father saw her leave, he told me, and he did nothing. All this was years ago, but I can still feel the sadness of that time, waiting for her to come back. I know now what I couldn't have known then. She wouldn't just be gone, she'd stay gone. I don't think about why she left. It doesn't matter anymore. What matters is that she did. What more is there to think about than that? Often I dream of seeing her face, still young like she was then. And although I can't remember the sound of my mother's voice, she is always trying to tell me something, her lips wrapped around shapes I can't hear. The dream might last only a few seconds, but that's all it takes really to undo the time that has passed, that has been put between us. I wake from these dreams, a child raw, a child feeling like a child still, though I'll I am 45 now and grieve the loss of her again and again. My father did not grieve. He had done all of this life's grieving when he became a refugee. To lose your love, to be abandoned by your wife was a thing of luxury. It meant you were alive. The other night, I saw an image of the earth on the evening news. I had seen it many times before. And although my mother was not there, I spoke to her anyway, as if she was. See, it really is round. Now we know for sure. I said it out loud again. And even though it disappeared, I knew what I had said had become a sound in the world. Afterwards, I went to the bathroom mirror and stared at the back of my mouth. I opened my mouth wide, saw the hot, wet, pink flesh and the dark center where my voice came out of. And I laughed loud and wild. The sound went into the air vent and I imagined people living in the building, wondering to themselves where a sound like that came from. What could make a woman laugh like that at this hour of the night? It's very powerful and, and I, I can see how you know, a, a reader I think it's, you know, it's, it's also very intimate to think that it is, you know, your experience. Um, and there are many similarities, you know, throughout the stories in terms of, like you were saying, I, I really loved your distinction between talking about the, the point of view and talking about and perspective. Right, it's the adult perspective, which we really see um, here with this, uh, with this story. I just have a question that, um, just thinking in terms of as, as you're reading and listening to you, and you mentioned that how to pronounce life is being translated into other languages. 
um, and it's also been available now uh, in English as, as an audio book. Mm -hmm. We recently had a, a program with an audiobook performer and, and talked about that side of, of the creative process. And just wondering, um, did you work with your um, publisher to for that audiobook to be I did. I I cast the voice that is on the audiobook. I listened to all of the auditions and I I chose the actor because of the way he delivered the line, dad worked in a factory. Uh, when we read, we bring our own interpretations, interpretations that other people put on us. Uh, many people feel like working in a factory is a thing to be ashamed or embarrassed or humiliated by, but for me, the, that is where my parents work. That is a fact. It's not something I'm ashamed of or embarrassed or humiliated about. And so when I heard that voice deliver the line, dad worked in a factory, and he said it with, as a matter of fact, I knew that he understood the stories emotionally. These are not sad stories. There are sad moments. Um, but um I, I thought that the voice also being a male voice um, would detach any idea that um, these stories are real. Um, I think when, when we assume that these stories are taken um, from real life stories, sometimes it can rob the writer of their artistic power. Um, to make up, to make, to make something out of nothing. Um, you know, well, I mean, there are some things that are real, um, but what I put down on paper is not just a bunch of words with, with just feelings. What I'm doing is I'm making the reader feel what I write. Um, if you've never had um, fermented fish sauce your whole life, you will find yourself crying when you get to the part about remembering the taste of the mother's fermented fish sauce. And then you'll sit back a little bit and go, oh, wait a minute, I've never had fish sauce before. Why did I feel like I've had it my whole life? That is the thing I set out to do is to trick you into believing that these are your stories, these are your feelings. Um, it, the text is very porous. Wherever you come from, whatever life experience you have or don't have, you can enter the story and feel like that's you. Yeah, not, not to bring me <laughs> into it. I mean, there definitely it spoke to me at, at many levels. And I know like my father, he, he worked in the factory all his life and he was always very, um, very proud of his work mm -hmm. and very detailed. And, and also, and you mentioned your father and the Beatles and like, my father, he had a photo of Moses. Like, <laughs> but definitely uh, you can see how it can speak to everyone. Definitely spoke to me. Um, I have uh, one more question now um, and then just going to ask if any of our viewers would like to also put in a question you can do that either in the chat box or on the q a panel here on zoom or if you're watching us through facebook live you can put it in the comment um in the comment box on, on facebook um so can you share anything about like upcoming projects i mean do you you, you, you write across genres, you know, you have your a poet and also you write your short stories. Um, are you planning on exploring other genres or novel? Um, um, I'm working, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm working on a novel and it's going to, I have to deliver it to my publisher in September. So in two months, it's, I'm a little behind. I'm supposed to deliver it in December, but I won the Giller Prize 
And so that was a bit of a distraction. Um, I, um, I, I, I'm, I'm starting to write reviews, literary reviews. Um, I always found um, the literary critics who handled my books, I mean, lovely that they've given me time and attention, but often they would just describe it as stories about refugees and immigrants, which is true, but I'm up to much more than that. And um, I don't know, I, I just, I want to read um, other writers' books and bring my own, you know, what I know um, and, and bring a different eye and perspective and point of view. Um, and I was very lucky this year that the New York Times book review, um, the editors there invited me to write reviews for two books. One has come out and it was a novel by Avni Doshi. Um, another thing I'm working on is that How to Pronounce Knife is going to be a TV show. Um, and the producers meet um, to at this moment to write the pilot episode. Um, and next year we'll probably cast um, characters. Um, it's going to be uh, really, um, they're going to keep the voice of the stories. You know how in a lot of movies or shows, somebody dreams. I mean, we see these characters and we're all invested. And then it, later on, we discover that it's all just a dream. Similar to that, the way that they're structuring the show is that um, all the characters you see in How to Pronounce Knife, um, all these stories will be episodes. But um, what we'll discover in the end, um, not to give anything away, is that they're all just stories that um, somebody made them up. Um, and they were going to show scenes of like random people that the main character might encounter, say, on a, on a subway. Um, but that will be revealed um, later on. That's wonderful and definitely very exciting. So <laughs> look forward to the novel, to the to the show. And if you have any input, I mean, I don't know if there are any plans to, it would be lovely to reissue your, some of your poetry, oh. like small arguments or through an audio production of you reading your poetry, that would be amazing. I'd love that too, actually. <laughs> um, I guess I'll have to talk to my agent about that or, um, I guess readers uh, should be vocal about wanting that because, you know, when the writer suggests it, it just seems delusional. <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, let me see if there, I'm just checking to see if there are any questions um, right now that have been posted. So please, if anyone has a question, please go ahead and share that with us. Um, what you mentioned, um, I think it was Avadoshi? Uh, Avni Doshi, yeah. She wrote the novel Burnt Sugar. Burnt Sugar, okay, I'll have to look at that. Do you have, you know, when you're not writing, do you have other authors that you're reading or any recommendations? I really like um, really old books. Um, I think I go back and read them over and over to see what is it about that voice that we're still returning to. Um, um, a book that has been really special to me is, um, is the writing of Edward P. Jones, his story, The First Day of, um, it's called The First Day, and in it, it's, it's about a little girl on the first day of school. Um, the way that he writes from the perspective and point of view of a child is, is just so masterful. Um, and I, read, I really read everything um, that I come across. I'm not, um, I'm not, you know, very... Um, snobby about what I read like I will read um the words on a jam jar 
uh, the ingredients and I will feel so moved by it because it's really hard to write ingredients in who decides on the order of those ingredients and also those, the list of those ingredients can save a life. What if you're allergic to one of those things in the jam uh, recipe? Um, I really will, I just read everything really. Well, you know, language is in uh, all aspects of our, of our life. So, mm -hmm. um, and actually we have a question. We have a few questions coming in. Um, so one of our viewers would like to know, do you handwrite your stories? Um, I do because, you know, I, I've been writing for 25 years. Um, I wrote when there were no computers. I wrote when there was just a typewriter. Um, but one thing I always return to over and over is handwriting. Um, there's something I feel with, with the computer, I feel I'm too quick with the delete button. I like to see the mistakes, the errors, what I was trying to get at, what I was up to, and the delete button takes all of that away from me. Whereas if I write it out, um, I can see where what I was trying for, what what I was trying to achieve, and and that error, that mistake, that that not quite there moment is all there in the handwriting on the piece of paper. And, um, you know, no, uh, my, it, it's not something I can lose it if I lose the device that contains it, because, you know, it's a piece of paper. <laughs> Along those lines, and I love that not quite there moment, um, do you keep journals? I do. Um, I think I, I've had um, a notebook since I was 12 years old. Um, you know, I can hear, I go back sometimes, you know, we forget who we were when we were 12, the sound of our own voice when we were 12, but I have all of that there. I remember who I was, what I was hoping for, the things that made me happy that seemed so simple. Like, I remember an entry that I wrote about getting my first pair of jeans at age 12. I was so excited. Um, and I look back at that and it's so lovely, but also so funny. I'm so funny. <laughs> um, and, you know, I love, I love that I know the future of that person. I know what's going to happen to her next month, next year. I don't have to predict it. I know. And, but that person that I encounter on that page doesn't know it yet. Um, I remember reading Joan Didion's essay on keeping a notebook about why she keeps a notebook because um, you have to be in touch with the people that you were. Otherwise they come, they come up in your life and ask or demand, um, you know, for your attention. Um, sometimes I do feel, you know, who I was at 12, uh, is still upset and I have to tend to those wounds. Um, and it's just interesting to get to see that, that voice on the page, how alive it is. That's the thing about writers, right? We, we write, but we really don't always know how to sound alive. <laughs> But your, your writing is definitely very much alive. I mean, I think it jumps off the page at you. Um, and I was just laughing because I think I got my first pair of jeans when I was like 13 or 14. So I very vividly remember that time. <laughs> um, <laughs> viewers is asking, um, so how has your writing or your, how your writing interest or your writing style, how has it changed over the years? That's a good question. Um, it used to be, I took myself way too seriously when I was younger. Um, and when I wrote poetry, I was, I, I didn't show my sense of humor. 
Whereas when I when I stepped into prose, um, nobody was waiting for my work of prose. And in a way that was so freeing, I could do whatever I want. I could reinvent myself. Um, and I did. And the it was just, it came really easy. You know, in a poem, sometimes a sentence takes 20 years to write because I take myself too seriously. Whereas in fiction, I just let that, or maybe, you know, having spent 25 years being so careful with my words, um, maybe that helped me arrive at the page now and, and to get there faster and to bring in elements that I hadn't touched before. Um, let's see if there are any other questions. I think, you know, kind of thinking also then about writing, you're saying you changed your, your, your style, no one was expecting your, your, your short stories or a change. Um, thinking about also other writers and upcoming writers, aspiring writers, you know, there's always been a very rich cultural production by, you know, black indigenous immigrant people, by people of, of color, it's just not necessarily had the access available mm -hmm. or the means to, you know, um, to control, to pr produce, um, make that known. Um, what, and, and now publishing is starting to, you know, address equity in, in, in publishing. Um, to some extent or, or creating some more spaces, but what type of maybe recommendations do you have for aspiring writers, and for example, especially aspiring writers, you know, color who write um, languages? Write what you want. Um, I, I understand that, well, I understand that sometimes, you know, people want or a, pub, a reading public or a publisher wants, um, you know, one thing. Um, and that's the only one thing that they, and if you're not that one thing, um, who you are, what makes you special, what makes you brilliant and spectacular, um, you compromise on because you want to be that one thing for them. I think the advice I would give to um, any writer is don't stop asking for advice. Um, anytime you ask for advice, you are discounting what you know, um, what makes you spectacular and brilliant. Um, and I think you already know what you're, what you're asking for, whatever advice, that is that um, you think you need from someone else, you already have it. And I just think you should move forward with that. Um, and um, any publisher um, can't, should, can, will value that. Um, that's what I do. I mean, that's what I did. Um, I understand that, uh, you know, people think it's a risk to write about um, Asian women who are not uh, submissive and quiet, um, but who, who are actually loud and rambunctious and um, funny. Um, but it isn't actually a risk it's just the truth <laughs> um it's uh, you know um i think readers should have a you know a diverse view um and of of who people are what they sound like what they what they look like um what what they think all these stories have to do or um, show a thinking person. On the spot, you know, unapologetic, uncompromising, be yourself. Thank you. That's you know, wonderful advice and very true. 
and I think it's a you know powerful note on which that to end our program tonight. Um, it's it's been a privilege and a very insightful evening, and really appreciate you giving us your time to share you know, your thoughts and you know give us a sneak into your you into your life and, and your experiences behind the stories. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. The privilege is really mine. So um, thank you. We hope that um, for those who might want to view this conversation again, please check out our website. You can check the Facebook for a viewing of this. Again, the book is How to Pronounce Knife, our author Suvankam Tamavongsa, and we look forward to continuing to see much more from you. Thank you. And everyone have a good night.